Okay, we're good to go. Uh, attendees are streaming in and we're streaming live on YouTube. Whenever you're ready, Tharani. Oh, sounds good. All right, welcome everyone to the second press briefing of June 7th, 2021 at the 238th meeting of the American Astronomical Society. My name is Tharani Kunchati. I'm the AAS Media Fellow, and I will be your MC for this briefing. The rest of the press team consists of Rick Feinberg, AAS Press Officer, Susanna Kohler, the editor of AAS Nova, and as of a few weeks ago, the person who will be assuming Rick's responsibilities when he retires in September. And rounding out the press team, we have Luna Zagorak, the Astrobytes Media Intern. Now, uh, for this briefing, Luna will be handling the Q&A, Rick will be keeping an eye on the Slack, and Susanna will handle just about anything else that happens to come up. There should, will be press releases associated with some of the presentations during this briefing. The press releases and other materials associated with the first briefing of today have been uploaded to the AAS website and posted on the press Twitter. Now we are recording this briefing and we'll are simultaneously streaming it to YouTube. Uh, if you haven't been to one of these before, the way it works is I will introduce the topic as well as the speakers. The speakers will all go one after the other and we'll have a grand big Q&A session at the end of the briefing. Uh, for Q&A sessions in this format, we are using Zoom's inbuilt Q&A feature, which you should be able to access at the bottom of your screen. You just type a question in and we will get it on our end. If you see that someone's asked a question that you already have, you can upvote it and move it up the queue. Presenters will not be answering questions via text. They will be answered orally at the end of all the, at the end of the briefing. For any non-Q&A related chatter, you can use the press conferences channel in the meeting Slack. It is, you can access it using hashtag press underscore conferences when you search for the channel. So the topic of today's briefing is black holes and active galactic nuclei. We've got five talks for you today. First, we have Alexia Lopez of the Jeremiah Horrocks Institute at the University of Central Lancashire with a giant arc on the sky. Next, we have Kohei Ichikawa of Tohoku University with the serendipitous discovery of a dying active galactic nucleus in ARP 187. Next, we have W. Neil Brandt and Chingling Ni of Pennsylvania State University with a sensitive X-ray survey of the Rubin slash LSST deep drilling fields. Next, we'll have Jonathan Williams of the National Science Foundation and University of Maryland with emerging galaxy triple hosting a potential dual active galactic nucleus. And finally, we have Yorick Fink of the Armagh Observatory and Planetarian, Planetarium with forming an impossible 85 solar mass black hole. And with that, I will now turn it over to Alexia. Mm. Okay, so can everyone see my slides? Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Alexia Lopez. I'm a PhD student at the University of Central Lancashire in the UK. Today I'll present to you a giant arc on the sky, which is an extremely large crescent structures of galaxies in distant space. And it's so big that it's hard to explain with our current theories. To study large scale structure means to assess the distribution of the matter in the universe. A large scale structure is an overdense region of space on some specified large scale that's made up of galaxies and clusters of galaxies. In cosmology, we have what's known as the cosmological principle, which states that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Homogeneous means that the matter distribution looks the same everywhere, i.e. the same average density above some specified large scale. It's currently estimated that on scales greater than 1.2 billion light years, the universe should look homogeneous. 
And isotropic means that the universe looks the same in all directions. It is important we test these two properties of the universe. For the homogeneity, we can assess this by looking at the large scale structure. But why is it so important? Well, the standard model of cosmology, the model that describes everything in the universe, the nature, the dynamics, the contents, the beginning and the ultimate fate, is founded on the cosmological principle being true. So to emphasize, for the universe to be homogeneous on scales larger than 1.2 billion light years, we must rarely find structures that exceed these scales. But the reality is there is already several large scale structures exceeding these scales. And today I present a discovery which is almost three times the theoretical threshold. The method we use is intervene in magnesium two absorption systems in the spectra of quasars, which sounds quite fancy and complicated, but I'll break it down. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey has mapped and measured almost three quarters of a million quasars, which are really bright galaxy cars, over one third of the sky. The light travels across the universe and passes through the gas around galaxies. Some of the light from the quasar is absorbed by this gas and it leaves a signature feature like a fingerprint in the spectrum of the quasar. We're interested in the absorption feature from singly ionized magnesium or the magnesium two doublet feature, which indicates the presence of galaxies. Independent authors have catalogued around 40,000 magnesium two absorption systems in these spectra. And we've used these magnesium two catalogs to map and analyze the large scale structure. Here I present a giant arc of magnesium two absorbers corresponding to a large scale structure of galaxies. The gray contours or splodges represent the magnesium two and the dots represent the background quasars. The giant arc spans 3.3 billion light years, which is almost three times the theoretical threshold. In fact, if you had 15 giant arcs, they would reach from here to the edge of the observable universe. The giant arc is 9.2 billion light years away, which means we're seeing it when the universe was only half its present age. As can be seen in the figure, the giant arc looks intriguingly symmetrical. It's densely packed and it stands out against the rest of the field. If we could see the giant arc in the night sky, it would look something like this. It stems off the top of Buites the herdsman, or Buites the kite-shaped constellation, and spans 10 degrees on the sky, which is equivalent to 20 full moons. Assessing large-scale structures is no easy task, but we've used three different statistical tests to assess the significance of the giant arc. The significance tells us how confident we can be that our result is a real detection and not just something due to chance alignment. Pictured here is the result from one of the three statistical tests. It mimics a minimal spanning tree, which to crudely put it, is an algorithm that joins the nearest dots and generates structures found within the field. The algorithm locates the giant arc in two parts, one very large portion and one smaller portion. The larger portion has a significance of 4.5 sigma, which means we have over 99.9997% confidence in our result. We plan to take further steps in assessing the giant arc. For instance, we've already taken a quick look at the quasars in the same neighborhood as the magnesium two absorbers, and this shows a tentative association. Going forward, we plan to look at other data in the same field as the magnesium two absorbers, as this can help indicate the environment of the giant arc. So to summarize, we have found a giant arc of magnesium two absorbers corresponding to a large scale structure of galaxies. The giant arc spans 3.3 billion light years, which is almost three times the theoretical threshold. And it's also amongst several other large scale structures, indicating a potential challenge to the standard model. Statistical tests show that the giant arc is indeed significant, and a quick look at other data suggests an association between the quasars and the magnesium two absorbers. And the press release will be available at this link later today. Thank you. Do I stop share now? And mute.
Okay, so hello everyone, can you hear me? Probably, yes. Yes, we can. So hello everyone, I'm Kohei Chikawa. I'm a Fris Fellow at Tohoku University in Japan. Today, I'd like to introduce uh, one interesting Asian, a dying Asian whose nucleus is already died, but still we can see a kind of remnant emissions in the surrounding area. Let me start my talk about uh, from the AGN. AGN uh, gas accreting event to the center of supermassive black holes uh, at the center of galaxies. This black hole is actually really huge, whose mass is from 1 million to the 10 billion times the mass of the sun. And nobody knows how such a big black hole is grown. Actually, AGN is a key component because you know they are in a growing phase of the such black holes. And one beauty point of the AGN is, you know, they are really bright in the multi wavelengths from radio, even to X-ray. This is a radio image of the AGN. As you can see, we see a two important component. One is that this extended radio jet component. And if you look at the center, we can see a radio core, which is considered to be uh, uh, associated to the central black holes and also the accretion disk. Recently, an uh, event horizon telescope uh, revealed such beautiful donut image, which should be associated with black hole and accretion disk. So the, this kind of AGN is ignited once gas starts pouring into the center. But the today's question here is if there is a starting point, there also should have an ending point. In other words, can we find uh, the ending or the dying phase of such AGN? But answer is actually really difficult because the uh, agent lifetime is considered to be really, really long, uh, over 100,000 years, which is well beyond the lifetime of the human. So the, this, is, it, this is why it's really difficult to catch up such dying phase. But uh, today, we would like to introduce uh, one such dying agent uh, in a galaxy named Up-27. One day, uh, we observed uh, Up-27, in uh, Aruma and Buere radio telescopes. And then we obtained a composite image uh, as shown in the panel. Uh, this shows a very beautiful bimodal extended radio jet lobe emissions. But this image also tells a really important another indication that if you look at the center, we couldn't see any radio core. This means as uh, the current agent activity, probably it's already silent. So in order to check this much more, we obtained much wavelength information uh, which traces a different agent component. First, we have checked optical spectra because it traces uh, extended ionized gas regions ionized by the central engines. So the typical agent as shown in the green color blobs, uh, we can see ionized gas uh, that can be traced by uh, ionized oxygen. So we obtained optical spectra and checking the, such emission lines. And we detect a really, really strong ionized oxygen. And then in other words, up 27 has such extended ionized gas component uh, radiated by AGM. Another important point is that this agent luminosity estimated from the ionized oxygen is really, really huge, which is reaching uh, over one trillion times the luminosity of the sun which is a really bright. On the other hand, if we want to detect uh, you know, current agent activity, uh, X-ray is the best because they are tracing the central nuclear core emissions. If we observe agent in a typical way, uh, we can detect such uh, point source-like features in the hard X-ray band. In order to detect them, we obtained uh, NASA X-ray new star satellite observation time and observed up 27, which is the best way to detect a central engine. So the result is like this. Even by using uh, you know, very sensitive NASA new star satellite, we couldn't detect any emissions from the central of the up 27. This gives a really, really strong upper bound of the current agent activity, which is at least 5,000 times fainter than the value estimated from the extended uh, ionized oxygen emissions. So what is happening to up 27 uh, Typical region has both of central nucleus emission and also the extended ionized gas regions. But that's not true uh, for, for up 27 uh, We couldn't see any uh, 
nuclear emissions from radon X-ray, but we can see extended ion mass gas regions. So this means probably the AGN has recently shut down the activity within a thousand years. This is why that we couldn't see any nuclear emission, but still we can see extended component because uh, you know, extended component has a 3000 light years length. In other words, it takes 3000 years for the light to pass in through at the edge of the now uh, extended gas regions. So let's wrap up. So the nucleus of the R27 is already dead, but we can still see a remnant emission in the surrounding area as a past agent activity. We call it as a dying agent. So the dying agent experienced really strong up, uh, decline of the agent activity over 5,000 times fainter within a thousand years. You want to check much more, please check the papers and my double stop tomorrow. Thank you very much. Should I begin? Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, today, uh, Chingling Ni and I would like to present the completed observations of a sensitive X-ray survey of much of the Rubin LSST deep drilling fields. This has been a large long-term project. I've been working on it for about seven years myself. It, it has required a large international team of about 35 people known as the XMM serves collaboration. And, and I think that this X-ray survey will have lasting value providing the foundation for many new discoveries in, in the coming years. Our results will appear soon in an AppJ supplements paper led by Ching Ling, uh, which presents the X-ray catalogs and the basic source characterization for the two fields shown here. The field on the left is the wide Chandra deep field south. Uh, with uh, the XMM Newton Observatory, we have now uh, made a panoramic 4.6 square degree uh, X-ray image around the well-known uh, Chandra deep field south ultra deep uh, X-ray survey region. Uh, and this field is in the southern constellation of Fornax. Over here on the right is uh, the second field. This is the Elias S1 field, another leading sky surveys region. It's even further to the south than the Chandra Deep Field South. And here the X-ray imaging covers about 3.2 square degrees. And most of the X-ray sources you can see here, there's 6,700 of them in total, um, are growing supermassive black holes in the distant universe. Now these two fields that I've just described combined with the XMM LSS field which is a field that our team published earlier back in 2018, led by a postdoctoral researcher in my group, Chen Ting Chen, make up the XMM serve survey that was conducted with the XMM Newton uh, Observatory, shown in the, the lower left. And XMM serves helps to fill the gap between deep pencil beam surveys over tiny solid angles and shallow X-ray surveys over large solid angles, tens or hundreds of, of square degrees. And we have surveyed these three fields uh, sufficiently sensitively to capture most of cosmic black hole accretion power out into the distant universe, while also covering respectable sky areas. Uh, now this practically means that these observations were very expensive. This took about 5 million seconds of XMM Newton observation. So it was a large investment of XMM time. And, and we carefully cited uh, these observations in the prime parts of the deep drilling fields of the legacy survey of space and time to be conducted soon, starting in 2023 by the Verisi Rubin Observatory. So the Rubin LSST folks have already selected four fields shown in this sky uh, image on, on the bottom that Rubin will observe significantly more intensively than its main survey over the whole Southern sky. And, and in these fields, uh, Rubin will likely obtain multi-band observations every few nights over a 10-year period, spanning about 900 epochs, which would be amazing for studies of variability. And the X-ray data that we've gathered in, in these three fields, the ones in yellow, will wonderfully complement the, the Rubin data uh, for studies of supermassive black holes and other cosmic X-ray sources. And, and Ching Ling will take over now 
and, and tell about tell us about some of the exciting science. So in total, around 12,000 X-ray sources are detected by the XM service survey. As you can see in this cutout, most of them are point-like X-ray sources, such as the source inside the yellow circle here. These point-like X-ray sources are mostly active galactic nuclei, which indicate the active accreting activity of supermassive black holes in galaxy centers. This illustration here shows a supermassive black hole, the accretion disk, and the corona loops where X-ray emission comes from. Since the accretion process of supermassive black hole happens in a subparsic scale that is very difficult to observe directly, studying AGNs provide a very effective way to study supermassive black hole growth. With this massive new survey, we can access population data about growing supermassive black holes to better understand their physical properties and evolution over cosmic history. There are also a small fraction of extended X-ray sources detected such as the one within this white circle, where extra emission comes from hot gas in a galaxy cluster. About 90% of our extra sources detected have counterparts at other wavelengths. Matching extra sources with their optical and infrared counterparts are pretty important because we can only perform reliable source classification and characterization with the four spectral energy distributions. Particularly with multi-wavelength information, we could estimate the redshift of X-ray sources in our survey field. Redshift can let us know what time since the Big Bang we are looking at when we study these sources. As can be seen in the histogram here, our sample spans most of the cosmic history and there are thousands of AGNs detected in each bin. The XM Serve survey has great legacy value, particularly for studies of AGNs in the ne next decade. As mentioned earlier, all of the XM Serve survey fields are LSST deep drilling fields. AGNs identified by XM Serves could serve as a ground truth sample of AGNs to calibrate the AGN selection algorithm in deep drilling fields. As you can see in the image here on the left, some AGNs are obscured in the optical and are relatively hard to be identified reliably because we can only see its host galaxy emission. While in the X-ray, the contamination from galaxy emission is small so that AGN can be reliably detected as a point source. The AGN selection algorithm chained in LSST deep drilling fields with the ground truth sample provided by our XM serve survey could be further applied to the main survey, which will ultimately help LSST find tens of millions of AGNs across the whole southern sky. Also, the AGN sample provided by XM serves enables us to study supermassive black hole growth across a full range of cosmic environments, which will be unbiased by local cosmic factor. Here is a cosmic density field simulated around redshift around 1.4. We could see that a single small survey field is not able to capture all the structures, while several separate large fields can. The XM serve survey fields are not only the deep drilling fields of LSST, but also the size of several spectroscopic surveys in the next decade. These spectroscopic surveys could provide accurate redshift measurements and characterization to AGNs, and in some cases, measure the mass of supermassive black hole. The XM serve survey fields are also the size of other upcoming surveys, such as the Meerkat survey in the radio, Torcat and ELMA surveys in the submillimeter, one of our survey fields is also among the Euclid deep, deep field. All these will further contribute to new discoveries about growing supermassive black holes in the XM survey survey fields. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Jonathan Williams from the University of Maryland and the uh, National Science Foundation. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about merging galaxies, merging black holes, a bit of a mystery, and a system that seems to combine all of these and more. So how galaxies develop over time has been the subject of a lot of study, modeling, and theory. We know that galaxies sometimes run into each other and merge. Our own Milky Way galaxy has done this several times in the past and will again. In about four and a half billion years, we will run into the Andromeda galaxy, which is currently on a collision course with us. When galaxies merge, their structure is often disrupted. 
with stars sometimes flung out and away or tidal streams of dust, gas, and stars forming, as you can see here in this model of a galaxy merger. And their central supermassive black holes also likely merge, helping these colossal objects grow even larger. As we now know, merging black holes produce gravitational waves. In the future, new instruments such as LISA and NanoGrav are expected to detect the merging black holes at the center of galaxies. Knowing how often such mergers take place will help us know what to look for and when we're seeing something unexpected. Finally, work is ongoing on how the black holes at the center of galaxies became as massive as they are. So mergers are a part of this process. Galaxy mergers appear to play a crucial role in the history and development of the universe. The object we have been studying is a merger of three galaxies. The merger is shown in the high resolution image to the right. This is composed of red, green, and blue wavelengths taken by the ESO Multi-Unit Spectroscopic Explorer. Few, su few such triple mergers have been observed at this point that also exhibit dual AGN behavior. For this project, we've made use of observations in optical, radio, and infrared. Also, X-ray observations have been made of this system and analyzed. Instruments included the ESO VLT Muse mentioned before and WM Keck OSIRIS integral field spectrographs, as well as the ALMA Interferometric Radio Observatory and additional studies again have employed the Chandra X-ray satellite. The combination of these powerful instruments have allowed in-depth, spatially resolved analysis across multiple wavelengths. So going back to our overview and using all of this data, we have found this object in particular is even more unusual in that two of the three merging galactic cores are emitting at least some signals consistent with active galactic nuclei, or AGN, produced when central black holes consume large amounts of material. This year, Ford and co-authors found that the two southern cores in this system are producing X-rays consistent with AGN activity using data from NASA's Chandra satellite. And optical signals also show two very bright cores consistent with the X-ray data. The northern core, by contrast, appears to be a dwarf galaxy that may have passed through the other two already and is connected by a tidal stream of dust and gas. This object is about 820 million light years away, and the two closest cores are separated by about 9,100 light years. By comparison, our sun is about 8,200 light years from the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. Observations of this system have revealed information about radial velocity and composition of the material, as well as dynamics and total light emitted by each core. They've raised questions about what is happening in each merging core, as well as the eventual fate of the system. Here we can see velocity of material derived from hydrogen line data. This data reveals the complex structure of the merging system, including the tidal stream of dust, gas, and stars connecting the northernmost core with the southern two cores. And this stream provides a means to gauge the dynamics of the system. So we have important clues of what is happening in this system and what will happen. A key mystery in this system revolves around what is happening in each core. Mergers are messy. Black holes start turning on, showing AGN behavior and turn off again, and dust and gas can obscure what we see. The central core, for instance, shows some signs of AGN activity, but not everything we would expect to see. It is very bright and it appears to be an X-ray source but the light we see isn't quite right. We can see from radio observations that there is molecular gas in this core and from optical observations that there is dust. But is there so much dust and gas that the key signs of AGN activity are partially obscured? Areas around the core seen in red in this high resolution image do match what we'd expect from an AGN. So work is ongoing. A larger mystery is why cores turn on and turn off. Is it molecular gas, in which case we would expect the central core to be on? Is it the black holes eating stars or something else? Finally, what will the fate of this system be? Modeling indicates a third core might be thrown off and away, taking momentum with it and making the two remaining cores merge more quickly. In summary, this system combines an unusual combination of features, some puzzling aspects, and the potential to answer a number of questions about AGN and galaxy mergers. Work is ongoing, and one thing is certain, more surprises lay in store. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to your questions. Thank <laughs> you.
Uh, right. I think it's my turn. Um, last summer, we were very excited by the discovery of a 85 solar mass black hole. This happened in this um, famous gravitational wave event announced by LIGO, LIGO Virgo collaboration um, of a merger between two very, very heavy black holes, um, 66 and 85 times the mass of the sun, producing a merged object of 142 times the mass of the sun. So that is really, really heavy and actually getting into the regime of what is called the intermediate mass black holes. These are black holes with masses in between stellar remnants black holes uh, and supermassive black holes that we heard about earlier. So this was deemed impossible. And why was this impossible? Because up to that point, people thought there was only stellar black mass black holes up to about 50 times the mass of the sun. And that anything above that would go bang in a pair instability supernova where electrons and positrons would annihilate and you would basically obliterate, obliterate the entire star and you would have no black hole, but all the elements would be um, given back to the interstellar medium. So in Arma, um, myself and, and my group were very excited by this. And so we set out trying to reproduce this, um, these, these heavy black holes. And um, to get to this story, I think it's instructive to go back a little bit in time. And that is the, uh, the first gravitational wave event that was now detected five years ago. That was GW 1509-14. And at the time, it was already quite surprising that these black holes were rather heavy, 30, 40 times the mass of the sun. Um, and that was surprising because in our own Milky Way from X-ray studies, most black holes of, of the stellar type are only 10 times the mass of the sun. So why do we suddenly have these heavy black holes? And the reason for that is that we think that this is to do with the metal content of the galaxy. What you see plotted here is the maximum black hole mass versus metallicity. This is the solar case, that means in today's universe. And if you go to lower metallicity, that means lower iron contents, you go to earlier times in the universe. And it turned out that in, in old calculations of stellar models with, with mass loss, that you would, independent of where you are sitting in the universe, you would always lose all that mass because um, you have a very strong mass loss because these stars are very luminous, they're very heavy, very luminous, and they have radiation driven winds where they blow out, out all the material and you can start with a very high mass, but you end up with just a 10 or 20 solar mass star. But then it turned out if you include the uh, stellar winds correctly in terms of how they depend on metallicity, that you can actually get much heavier black holes. So when we found a 40 solar mass black hole, we think that this, this formed at a metallicity about 10% of that in the Milky Way. And the reason for this is basically atomic physics. Um, so for the atomic physics pundits, you have the hydrogen atom here, you may have seen it, lots of uh, transitions, line transitions between different levels, but there's only relatively few lines for hydrogen. Now hydrogen is much more common than iron in the universe. Uh, there's a 2,500 times as much hydrogen as there is iron, but iron has millions of lines. So it's a very complex atom. And that means that this is responsible for the driving of all this mass loss uh, in hot star winds that are responsible for um, uh, basically uh, evaporating stars and, and making Newton stars instead of heavy black holes normally. So when this event happened about a year ago and you had an 85 solar mass black hole, we immediately realized this had to happen in a very low metallicity environment, but it cannot have gone above the 50 solar mass impossible limit uh, because that is where you would have um, a, um, a pair instability explosion. So what is the key? Well, the key is actually to make sure, and we have astrosismological um, uh, constraints on this, that in some cases, stars are relatively compact, um, that they don't mix as much as, as some of the other stars. And it will be those stars that are the, the least mixed stars that will give you the maximum black hole mass. And the reason is that you can keep the star relatively blue. Most stars, like these are really heavy stars, really luminous, like a million times the mass, uh, the luminosity of the sun. And most stars evolve to the red supergiant range. And there they have strong dust driven winds because these are cool. They are 3000 cells, degrees Celsius. Um, I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit, but um, uh, the, the point is that, uh, that these are, are, are losing a lot of mass because there's the strong dust driven winds. But if you can keep the star relatively compact, you can actually keep them blue 
And if you now go to a lower metallicity environment where you have less iron, then you can actually keep a 100 solar mass star at a relatively low mass loss rate. And therefore, you can actually form an 85 solar mass black hole. And both uh, Aaron Higgins and Gautam were both able, independently from each other, to reproduce an 85 solar mass black hole with the, the correct physical constraints on the mixing inside the star and the metallicity dependent mass loss. And now we can plot this also in a cosmic timeline. So here we have the, black, uh, the maximum black hole mass now versus not just metallicity, but basically the age of the universe. In the present day universe, because of all this mass loss, you would only get 20 solar mass black holes. But there will be a critical point at about 10 to 1 to 10% of the, of the metal content of the, of the Milky Way, where suddenly you get a much higher limit. And that is almost 90 times the mass of the sun, whereas the old limit was at 50 times the mass of the sun. So basically, with these new models, where we have this relatively compact blue supergiant, you, you can keep all the hydrogen compact during the, the core helium burning of the star, and you can still get heavy black holes. Only above that, the star is blown to pieces in, a, in apparent stability, and you have no black holes. So to summarize, early in the universe, we had lower metallicity, we had weaker winds, and therefore you kept um, most of the mass intact. You had heavier black holes. And in our models, uh, we can have 90, 100 solar mass stars that can keep their hydrogen envelopes. They, this is not expected to be lost in mass loss in the final phases or in an explosion. We think that we can keep most of this intact and actually form 85 solar mass black holes, uh, which were supposed to be impossible. And now we can do this as a function of metal content throughout the universe. And we can also go above the parent stability gap and really probe the black hole mass function as a function of cosmic time and perhaps find solutions to why are the first black holes, the supermassive black holes, so heavy? Because there doesn't seem to be time enough to do this via merging. Um, the most common explanation so far for this gravitational wave event that this 85 solar mass black hole was that this was a second generation black hole where you had basically already merged at a previous time with two masses below the 50 solar mass limit, say 40 and 45 or something. Um, but now we have shown that that is not necessary. Actually, a single star can make an 85 solar mass black hole. And we are very excited about this. And there's a lot in the future. Yeah, that's more or less what I wanted to say. Thank you to all our speakers. I will now turn it over to Luna for the Q&A. And I forgot to mention this, but when asking a question, please be sure to include your name and affiliation. Thank you to the question askers who have already done that. Uh, just one more thing for folks asking questions. If you see a question that you really want answered, you can upvote it and we will go in order of upvotes so that uh, everybody we maximize on happiness for everybody. Um, so, uh, okay, that just switched. So uh, the first question I see is for Alexia Lopez from Lisa Grossman of Science News. Can you speculate about how the giant arc might have formed? What does it mean for cosmology if the standard model just doesn't hold up? Um, sorry, can you just repeat that last part of the question? Surely. So could you speculate uh, about how the giant arc might have formed? And what does it mean for cosmology if the standard model doesn't hold up? Um, right. Okay. So, how the giant arc might have formed. So, um, I think I think possibly using simulations might be able to help look at how something like this could form. Um, obviously, we see the Sloan Great Wall, which is half the size of the giant arc, but you know, at much much closer to us. So, in the, in, in the near in the nearby universe. So, there's a possibility that something like the Sloan Great Wall. Um, could be similar to something like the giant arc, but obviously closer to our time. So maybe there's a similarity between something like the giant arc and the Sloan Great Wall, which might indicate how the giant arc might have formed or, or how it will look in the future. Um, and then in terms of the second question was, what does it mean for cosmology? Right. So what does it mean if the cosmological principle doesn't hold up? So if the cosmological principle doesn't hold up, then our standard model, um, you know, not to put too heavily, kind of falls through. Um, so, you know, the, there are alternative theories that can maybe help explain uh, like large scale structures and things like that. But the standard mo model, our 
our lambda called dark matter model is founded on the cosmological principle being true. So we have to have both homogeneity and isotropy in the universe for the standard model to hold. So it would, you know, overturn cosmology as we know it. <laughs> um, that's a joke. It, but, you know, it could have some <laughs> severe implications. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you for your question. <laughs> Okay, uh, the next question is also for you. So a question from Alexia Lopez from Ethan Siegel Forbes slash starts with a bang. This is the fourth large quasar group uh, I now know of claiming to violate large scale homogeneity by positing the discovery of a structure larger than standard cosmology predicts. Uh, however, Sesh Nadathur showed that without a fuller quasar survey over more of the sky, we could be misidentifying patterns in the noise as structure. And I worry about that here as well. How can you be confident that this is, oops, sorry, I just shifted, that this is a real homogeneity violating structure and not merely another one of these clusters of points that we misidentify as larger than expected large scale structure? Okay, so a lot to unpack there. Um, so let's start with, um, it's, well, it actually, it's not a large quasar group. It's, um, it's a giant arc of magnesium two absorbers corresponding to a large scale structure of galaxies, so not quasars. Um, the Nadatha reference you made, um, it is interesting to point out that actually there is the Marinello AL 2016 paper um, that talks about how, okay, so maybe if there's one large quasar group in a field five times the size of the, the Sloan um, field, that would be something to do with noise or a statistical fluke or something like that. But the fact that there are several large scale structures in much smaller sizes, in, in much smaller areas anyways, um, it kind of indicates that, well, it's not just one problem now, it's, it's several, it's several large scale structures all, you know, coming together and, and, you know, questioning the cosmological principle, the homogeneity. Um, it's also another point to note that the magnesium two absorbers has independent corroboration with the quasars in the same field. And um, so it would be it, for, for, the, for the magnesium two giant arc to just be on its own as a statistical fluke due to noise would be one thing. But because there's independent corroboration with the quasars as well, that kind of certifies or helps to certify the, the, the existence and the reality of the giant arc and obviously it's it's not the only structure um above this theoretical um threshold size the scale of homogeneity um does that answer everything i think was that all did i uh, far, far as i can tell that hits on the okay. uh, on the main point of the question Brilliant. Uh, okay great so the next one is for dr vink uh, so two questions from Rick Lovett of Cosmos Magazine. So number one, how does this explain the growth of supermassive black holes? And two, why don't the blue super, super giant stars go into a red giant phase and cool? What keeps them hot? Okay, um, let me start with the first one. Why do stars become red in the first place? Like the sun becomes a red giant um, because it ex expands after the core contracts and the envelope expands. But for very luminous stars, there's another effect that's called inflation. Um, when stars get very close to their radiation pressure uh, threshold, basically the radiation pressure and the gravity are in balance. It's called the Eddington limit. And because the stars get close to the Eddington limit, they inflate and become blue. Now it depends a lot on the mixing, uh, both um, above the core of a star and also in the envelope, what actually happens in terms of what radius the star will eventually get. And um, it depends on the assumptions about the amount of mixing in the star. And we can probe this with astroseismology. Now, there's still a lot of work to be done for the most massive stars. The astroseismological results are very insecure at the moment, but there are cases where you have very low amount of mixing, and that means you can keep the star relatively compact. You can keep it blue. I wouldn't really call it compact. You still have hundreds of radii, but you don't have thousands. Yeah? So, the star just don't, doesn't go there. It, it's helium burning that, that, that for the sun would, would happen in the red giant phase. Here happens in the blue uh, supergiant phase. Um, 
So they don't get, they don't lose this mass and they can, they can collapse. Um, at least that's our, our, our theoretical model. Um, how does that help the growth of, of super, to our supermassive black holes? Obviously it's, it's a struggle. We have supermassive black holes of a million and above, and we have stellar below it. And there's a whole gap in between. Now, what, what is happening? Now it helps, of course, the heavier seat you can create, the easier it is to get a supermassive black hole. But there's, there's more to it. There are now quasars being found, I think, very early in the universe that are extremely massive. And it becomes very hard to do this only with merging. You, it seems you need supermassive stars huh, in the early universe. Now, this is all very speculative, but if you can form 10 to the five solar type stars, then um, in the early universe, you may also start to get heavier black holes. And all the physics that we are dealing with in our own Milky Way and at lower metallicity environments for 100 solar mass stars, um, the issues to do with the Eddington limit, how much mass we lose, what kind of radius of the star you get, exactly the same kind of physics will be, need to be addressed for the supermassive stars. So I think that it, 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 it doesn't solve the problem of the supermassive stars, but it, it, it gives us more insight into the physics. Okay, um, and so another one uh, for Dr. Vink from Leah Crane, new scientist. Can you elaborate a bit more on how this could help us figure out how supermassive black holes formed? Thanks. It's uh, basically the same question, <laughs> so it's more or less the same answer. Okay. Yeah. I wanted to let you elaborate if you if you wanted to. Yeah. Okay. Um, so here's one for Jonathan Williams from uh, Lawrence Grow of the uh, Sky and Telescope Intern. So in your abstract, you mentioned the receding velocities of the central and northern core and that these differ. Is this why you think that the apparent dwarf galaxy may have already passed through the merger? Hi, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, actually, uh, from what the observations show, there is a tidal stream of dust and gas that connects uh, the central two cores to the northern core. Um, and this strongly hints that the northern core may have already passed through and is dragging um, dust and gas uh, with it um, as it proceeds in what may be an orbit or it may be proceeding out of the system um, on a path. Um, the tidal stream itself exhibits a lot of, um, of emission that is very characteristic of uh, ionization and AGN behavior. So it looks like that, that stream of dust and gas that is being dragged with it um, may have also come from the central cores. Um, additionally, if you look at the velocities uh, evident through that tidal stream, there's a smooth transition between the central core and the northern core, which strongly indicates again that that northern core uh, may be proceeding on an, on an orbit that is a little bit tilted from our vantage point. But again, uh, the, the tidal stream of dust and gas appears to be a product of, of an encounter that's already happened. I hope that answers the question. Okay, uh, and finally, the one more question that we have already posted is again for Alexia Lopez, uh, also from Lawrence Grove, Sky and Telescope intern. So what are future steps that could be taken to discover the mechanisms that cause these denser large scale structures? What type of observations would be necessary? Um I think, I think to understand these dense structures, it's, it's probably going to take simulations to, to fully understand them. Um, obviously, in terms of actual observations, um, you know, we plan on looking at, or at least scanning as much of the sky as possible. We've got all the SDSS data and all the magnesium two catalogs. So we can scan, essentially a third of the entire sky um, in quite a large redshift range. So continuing the work with scanning the sky with magnesium two might, I don't know, maybe discover more structures or maybe, you know, understand the large scale structure of the universe. Um, but in terms of understanding it, I, I suppose that's probably down the route of, of simulations and um, yeah, things, things like that, uh, but yeah. I think, think that answers the question. Um, another one just came in actually. So for Alexia Lopez, uh, Bastenhon, new scientist. 
what, if anything, do we know about the galaxies in the arc? How many are there? Do they have anything in common? Can we even see them except for the quasars in that neighborhood? Um, okay, so there's um, around 45 to 50-ish um, magnesium-2 absorption systems. Um, so the, the magnesium-2 can be detecting the galaxy halos um, or, for instance, the halos around um, maybe galaxy clusters as well. So I would say probably on the order of the same number of galaxies. Um, in terms of what we know about these galaxies, well, first, actually, they can't be seen fundamentally because behind them are bright quasars. So if you were to try and look in the exact direction of these um, galaxies per se, or like if there was a specific galaxy right there, you'd have a quasar in the way. Um, but we we can look at obviously the other data in in, in other, you know, um, in other types of galaxy catalogs and things like that. But um, yeah, so in terms of what we can know about the galaxies, um, we can have a look at the um, the strength of the magnesium two absorption systems. And, and that can sometimes indicate the um, position of the magnesium two cloud in relation to like, if it's really close to a galaxy or, or further away. Um, so yeah, I think, I think the best thing to possibly do, and it, it might be worth looking at like velocity dispersions as well, but I think the best thing we can probably do now is, is try and find as much independent corroboration as possible um, and, and continue in, in that kind of line of direction. Um, but yeah, there's probably on the order of like 40 or 50, uh, well, the, on the order of magnesium two absorbers at least. So that could mean galaxies or galaxy clusters. So. Okay, I don't see any questions at the moment, but uh, if anybody in the audience has any, particularly for uh, Neil and Jingling or for Kohei, uh, now is a great time to ask. I do, I do. All right, Go ahead. first question is for Kohei Ichikawa. Uh, so some years ago, uh, when the Galaxy Zoo project was um, first getting off the ground, there was a very well-publicized result on something called Hani's Vorwerk or Hani's object or thing. Um, and it, it seemed to bear some similarity to what you've described in that there was a, uh, we're seeing something, we're seeing this, you know, a, a gas and dust cloud of some sort that's been energized by an AGN, but the AGN isn't active anymore. And it's kind of like this thing is a remnant of it. And I'm wondering if uh, how, how the object that you've identified is similar or different from Hani's war work? Yeah, so the Hani's war work is a kind of the similar fading region sources that we are looking also. Uh, so the Hani's, uh, for example, the famous one, uh, it's uh, you know, showing the uh, you know, decreasing of the nuclear uh, luminosity at the center. And then, but the surrounding area, we can see uh, some you know, remnant emissions uh, with a large budget of the emission of the past region activity. So in such of the cases, uh, you know, our sources are quite similar, but our sources, you know, the current agent uh, is uh, completely dead. For example, no emission from the radio core and no emission, actually I didn't mention, but no emission from the nuclear infrared from dust emission. So the central range seems to be completely quenched. So the, not like a fading region, much more like a dead region. So this is a new, uh, really important point to understand how rapidly central range is quenched. Okay, thank you. Um, and my question for Neil and Chingling is, um, so you've identified all of these X-ray sources in these fields that, uh, that the Rubin Observatory is gonna be studying in great detail. I'm wondering, you know, how long do you think it will take or, you know, roughly when do you think you'll have more insight into into the populations that you've identified in these fields from Rubin. Is it is going to be something that's going to take years, or is it something that you know once they begin observing uh, that part of the sky, they're going to uh, they're going to have some interesting results for you pretty quickly? Go ahead, Chingley. Go ahead. We basically yes. The so Rubin will start its observations in 1993. So so the actual gathering of Rubin data 
because it's kind of like a multi-epoch observations and in these deep drilling fields, like it's, it's very likely to be observed in every two to three days. So once the data comes, the pipelines will like auto, automatically process this data. So it's just the ac accumulations of the depths. But once we have accumulated, we say within one years, the data should be a good, have good quality enough for us to do some initial science um, uh, science discoveries. And even before that, we are preparing for AG and algorithms like, so that so that it should be ready uh, for direct ap applications once the Rubin data has came. So all these should happen before, before the actual accumulation of Rubin data. And we have mentioned that um, these XM sur survey fields have already have some good multi-wavelength data coverage in the optical to near infrared. So the Rubin will basically add to the bio uh, the data quality in variability uh, aspect. So, so the main the main value is that we were going to have it for multi actors. So the light curves of AGNs in the optical could be studied very well. But before that, we could or we have we can uh, already combine the X-ray information with the multi wavelength data that already in in this field to characterize some basic opportunity uh, uh, proper properties of growing supermassive black holes in this field. So all these should be done before the actual uh, Rubin data that will uh, enable us to further characterize the variability of these AGNs and get some deeper coverage for these AGNs that currently cannot have multi wavelength counterparts. And Neil could add if yeah. I'm... Yeah. No, I, I think that's great. So, so, so um, it's been a big job to get, to get to just get these things observed. It took a lot of time, many years of observation time. Um, and so now, now I guess the fun begins. Uh, now, now that we've done all the heavy lifting, uh, you know, to get these fields <laughs> observed and processed, and now we can run in and start doing science projects. And we're, we're already starting with that now. Yeah, uh, the, the paper, Chingling's paper is, is nearly accepted, uh, presenting the catalog, and we'll then release that to the astronomical community. And, and we're all that already running in to uh, start doing science projects. And once we release this publicly to the community, we hope other people in the community will also use these data to make good discoveries too. Okay, thank you all very much. We have, I think, just a couple of questions left until 30 minutes past the hour. Anybody have a last minute question? There's nothing in the Slack. All right. Well, I guess we can wrap things up then. So again, a big thank you to our speakers oh, for the- Hang on. Oh, one oh, one, one oh, just I'm came fine. through. Okay, uh, also from Lawrence Grove. Thank you, Lauren, for your wonderful questions. So for Kohei Ichikawa, uh, again, Lawrence Grove's Kind Telescope intern. How did you come across ARP 187? What led you to observe or study this AGN and make this discovery? Was it already a known potential dying AGN? Oh, uh, really uh, good questions. Uh, actually, there is uh, some story of one of my collaborators, uh, Jun Goveda, observed this galaxy in Aruma Band. Uh, in order to check, uh, you know, this is a major remnant actually. So that we, they wanted to check uh, the how the gas kinematic changed after the, you know, major mergers. So they, she obtained uh, the Aruma band and then gas kinematics. Uh, checking the gas kinematics. But this, this galaxy was so bright uh, in, so that they detected uh, you know, associated continuum and the associated continuum looks like a jet feature, but uh, no radio coalitions. This, this is a starting point to check much wavelength information. Yes. Then we found uh, no nuclear emissions, but that looks like extended component. They are so bright. Oh, okay, looks like it's a kind of dying agent who's recently died within a cell years. That was a story of the starting point to check our point of study. Thank you very much. Um, and one last one came through for Alexia about what are the other three groups that seem to violate the cosmological principle. Um, since it's 30 minutes past, we could relegate this to the Slack chat unless you have a quick answer. And um, I actually didn't fully hear the question, so. Oh, sorry. So the question is from um, Bastin Hon. What are the other three groups that seem to violate the cosmological principle? The other three groups as in other large scale structures? 
I believe that's what the question is referencing. Oh, well, there's more than just three more. Um, there's uh, probably about seven or eight, maybe, different large-scale structures that um, exceed the scale of homogeneity. So um, some are marked with gamma ray bursts, some are marked with quasars, some are marked with galaxies in the near redshift universe. So um, yeah, if that's what the question meant, then I think that's my answer, but I'm sorry if that's not what it meant and I'll answer it on Slack if not. All right. Yes, since as Luna has pointed out, it is 5.30, it's Eastern Daylight Time. We should end this briefing. So a big thank you to our speakers and also thank you to our audience for all your questions and also to those of you watching on the YouTube live stream. A big thank you to the public information officers who helped with briefing prep and the press releases. And finally, I'd like to thank our sponsor, University Space Research Association, for making these briefings possible. The next press briefing of the meeting will be tomorrow, that's Tuesday, June 8th, 2021, at 12.15 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And the topic will be molecules in strange places. We hope to see you there. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye-bye.